I'm Mitch Pileggi. There are a lot of amazing stories out there full of mystery and wonder. But things aren't always what they seem when you explore the unknown. Tonight. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Just how easy is it to lie and get away with it? This woman says she can read your body language and know for sure. And is it possible to beat a lie detector test? It's, it's a sad, sick joke that's antiquated uh, last best we did with it. There is an intruder in the home. Are these mysterious images evidence of a new and dangerous species? Or is it just a camera trick? Have scientists extracted the DNA of God from the Shroud of Turin? We proved that it was blood, that it was human, that it was male. Or is this sample not what it seems to be? Will the dead one day walk again? Look at all those people that needlessly went to their graves when they didn't have to. Or is cryogenic suspension a high-tech ripoff? The guys who are being frozen have a 5% chance of waking up and saying, beat me up, Scotty. Do you think you could tell a lie and get away with it? Maybe. But what if you were hooked up to a polygraph machine, with police detectives watching your every move, professionals trained to detect fact from fiction? That would be a different story. Or would it? Michael Shermer gets an inside look at the science of lie detection. Since its development by a Berkeley professor, in the early 1900s, the polygraph has been under heavy scrutiny. Polygraph is probably one of the most effective tools in determining if someone's telling the truth or not. It's, it's a sad, sick joke simply because many people's lives, their careers, and even our national security is hanging in the balance over this antiquated uh, last vestige of witchcraft. Despite the controversy, polygraph test results have played a key role in several recent high-profile cases. Susan Smith failed her polygraph and later was found guilty of drowning her two children. Richard Jewell passed his test and later was cleared of any involvement in the Olympic bombing. And O.J. Simpson failed his polygraph. The results were admitted into his civil trial and he was ultimately found responsible for the deaths of his wife Nicole Simpson and Ron Goldman. But is this just coincidence or can a machine actually determine if someone is telling the truth? I spoke to experts on both sides of this issue and even let myself get hooked up to a polygraph, all to determine if the truth is truly attainable. Polygraphs today are anywhere between 95 and 99 percent effective. D. Moody has been a polygraph examiner for 18 years, having administered over 7,000 tests. She showed me how the polygraph works by reenacting an exam. The polygraph measures basically three different uh, parts of our autonomic nervous system. We measure changes in respiration. We measure changes in uh, pulse rate. We also measure what we call galvanic skin response, which we measure with, by putting a couple of electrodes on the fingers of the individual, and it measures changes in sweat gland activity. When conducting an exam, D asks control questions, questions that are not directly related to guilt or innocence, to gauge the subject's normal response levels. Is your first name Sam? Yes. These control questions enable the examiner to accurately evaluate responses to the relevant questions, questions directly related to guilt or innocence. Are you lying on your test today? No. If a subject's reaction to the relevant question is greater than their reaction to the control question, the polygraph will find them to be deceptive. To illustrate how the polygraph gauges responses, Dee showed us the charts from an accused child molester. I had him write me a statement where, wherein he denied all the allegations regarding these children. So that was the question, did you lie in your written statement? And this is the spike in his galvanic skin response, right. which would tell you that he lied. But just one heightened response does not condemn someone. Polygraphers run three to four charts on each subject, asking the same relevant questions, slightly rephrased. 
I took this gentleman's charts and I ran them through the scoring algorithm. And as you can see, the results are deception strongly indicated. Seems like hard science, or is it? When the goal becomes to know for sure whether someone has told the truth, and when you bring in high technology and manipulative practices, then we have really a very potentially dangerous situation. Because the fact is, there is no reliable way of detecting whether someone is telling the truth or not. What the polygraph actually records in, in scientific terms is what's known as the fight or flight response. It's when your autonomic nervous system processes a shot of adrenaline, causes your breathing to become somewhat erratic, your blood pressure to increase, and your GSR to increase. This does not mean, however, that you have lied. It just means that you have been confronted with some stimuli that elicits this response. This stimuli could be that you have lied, but it could also be nervousness, fear, rage, embarrassment. Doug Williams is a former detective sergeant and polygraph examiner with the Oklahoma City Police Department. One of the many flaws he sees with the polygraph is branding someone a liar based on controlled questions. Let's compare, for example, the relevant question, did you rape Susie, with the, with the question, can you drive a car, or did you eat breakfast this morning? My problem with that is that there is not any way you can devise a control question that is the same emotional impact as a relevant question. During his 10 years on the force, Doug conducted over 6,000 polygraph exams. He set out to prove to me that the polygraph is not reliable by actually hooking me up to the machine and showing me how to produce a truthful chart. Are you a resident of the United States? Yes. Prior to the exam, Doug taught me breathing and muscle techniques. These techniques are known as countermeasures. Have you ever been taught countermeasures? No. That's a bold-faced lie. But according to Doug, I'll still be deemed truthful if my reaction to the next control question is greater than my reaction to the previous lie. Is your first name Michael? Yes. In order to elicit a reaction, I employ the countermeasures Doug taught me. I increase my breathing and tighten my muscles. Let me just show you here what you've done, Michael. As I'm writing here, that's when I'm asking you a question. This yep. is when you answer and so on. So this is your first question. Do you live resident in the United, United States? States yeah. Are you a resident of California? California yeah, nothing. Have you ever been taught countermeasures? I lied there, it shows nothing. And then, is your first name Michael? Wow. Massive increase, perfect breathing staircase at the highest GSR. This it's is just an absolutely perfect, beautiful textbook classic chart. I lied during my test, but according to Doug, the polygraph said I told the truth. Most examiners are trained to identify countermeasures, and I've seen it quite often, and when we see countermeasures being implemented, we discontinue the examination process. Which is exactly what Doug wants. Not only do I teach people how to beat it, I tell those in positions of authority that I'm doing what I'm doing and why I'm doing what I'm doing in hopes that they will quit using them because they know how easy it is to be manipulated. Do you live in California? Doug ran me through the yeah. polygraph four more times, and each time I was able to produce a, quote, truthful chart. That makes me very skeptical of this machine. As well you should be. It's like the old Tom T. Hall song. If you want to find a thief, you just hang them all and let God sort it out. And that's what the polygraph does. It just hangs them all. As a result of this concern, the Employee Polygraph Act was passed into law in late 1988. The law prohibits private businesses from subjecting their employees to polygraph exams. The Polygraph Protection Act occurred not because the polygraph is flawed or ineffective. It was taken away because it is too effective. And most of our leaders in this country felt that it was too invasive, that it just provided the potential employer with too much personal information about the individual. However, polygraphs are still used in law enforcement and governmental agencies. It's a very good confession getter. It's a very good psychological billy club. It's something that you can use to coerce a person into confessing and divulging all sorts of information, but it still does not detect deception because they're still based on the same false theory that there is a reaction that indicates deception and there is no scientific evidence to support that theory. People who offer high-tech solutions, all kinds of fancy gizmos that promise a way to give you the answer, that's a very appealing promise to be able to make, but they're dead wrong.
There's little debate that the polygraph effectively measures increases in heart rate, breathing, and perspiration, and that these increases may occur when someone is lying. But does it prove 95 to 99% of the time that someone is being deceptive? In my experience, not even close. Next, if lie detectors are unreliable, can we detect the truth simply in the way people act? Body language can predict if they're going to lie, if they are lying or not. And then, what are these strange objects caught on tape? We've measured them anywhere from four inches in length up to 100 feet in length. We've seen that the polygraph machine may not be a reliable detector of lies, but what about body language? We all communicate with our bodies, indicating, among other things, our moods and our emotions. Can we actually determine if someone is telling the truth simply by evaluating their body language? Joellen Demetrius is one of the country's top body language experts. Her trial consulting firm has helped pick over 400 juries. Her biggest claim to fame? assisting Johnny Cochran in selecting the jury for the O.J. Simpson criminal trial. American Lawyer Magazine dubbed Joellen the seer because she seems to be able to see if someone is being truthful by evaluating their body language. Body language can um, in many ways predict how people are going to behave, um, if they're going to lie, if they are lying or not. But some social scientists are concerned with the reliability of body language. There is no scientific research showing that anybody can tell with 90 to 100% accuracy whether somebody is lying or telling the truth based on their body language. I did not have... At no time in recent history has anyone's body language been under such heavy scrutiny as President Clinton's. Not a single time. I sat down with Joellen to evaluate some of the president's grand jury testimony. President Clinton, of course, um, is a very experienced, uh, polished uh, politician and is very aware of his body. And seeing a lot of the public appearances prior to that, I took note of how he acted. The things that were very different in his deposition were his licking his lips. He also rubs his nose. He changed his body position, which, again, when people get uncomfortable, they'll, you know, sort of rearrange themselves in their seat. Um, almost as if they're protecting themselves from the person asking the question or, um, or then they may turn like this and lean forward. He does that several times as well, almost as though I'm selling you this and boy, you better believe it because I'm telling you the truth right now. So again, these are things that he does not normally do. That's what made me believe um, that he was not being honest. But we'll never know for sure if the president lied, so we decided to do our own body language test. We had Joellen interview five of our show employees. She asked them a series of 15 to 20 questions. The five employees were told to lie at some point during their interview mm -hmm. and to be convincing. Good. What kind of thing do you do for the show? I'm a research assistant. Joellen did not get to speak to the subjects prior to the interview and was not informed which of the five yes. would be lying okay. or how often. We instructed um, the first interviewee, about, David, to lie on one question uh, of his choosing. Skills Again, the, uh, this information was not provided so to Joellen as she began to uh, evaluate the interview. Have you ever belonged to any organizations? Um, in college, I uh, was in uh, the public relations student society. And he looked down almost as if he was looking for the right answer. Mm -hmm. Again, there was a sense that, well, maybe he was looking down because he was kind of embarrassed about it. Mm -hmm. But in terms of how he's reacted up to this point, I think it's because um, he wasn't actually a member of a public relations group mm -hmm. in college. Okay. I think your other interpretation that he's maybe a little nervous or whatever is the right one because he, he told us that he, he didn't lie about this. Oh, for one. But there was another area in David's interview Joellen wanted to look at. What did you major in in college? Biology. Biology. Yeah. What was interesting about his response here is that he did a couple things. Number one was he took a deep breath. Biology. Secondly, he looked over um, to the side almost as though he was looking for the answer. Based on those responses, I think it's probably um, something that he was lying to us in this situation and not something that he was um, nervous about. Well, you are correct on this one. 
Next up, Andrew. As a production assistant, what are sort of your everyday duties? I'm the duties? office Herbert. I do all the little bits and pieces that no one else wishes to do. I'm the office the, Herbert? The office Herbert, yes. The <laughs> uh, bottom of the ladder. Andrew was also instructed to lie once. In previous jobs, have you ever embellished a resume? No. He answers very quickly. No. Um, and he doesn't have that, uh, that sense of humor, that dry, that dry wit. Okay, well he did indeed lie about his uh, embellishment of the <laughs> resume, so you got, you got that one, that's correct. Well, who hasn't uh, embellished a resume? <laughs> Just a little. With Tommy, we threw in a new Hi. twist. Hi, he Joe. was to answer all of Joellen's questions nice truthfully. What types of things do you do when you're not working? What do you do in your spare time? I have a three and a half year old son, so I spend a lot of time with him. Um, I'm involved with um, playwriting and um, production. He's very good um, in protecting himself. You'll notice the pose. Um, he's got his arms crossed, mm -hmm. he's got his legs crossed. He's I very protective of everything that's going on. I, I think that he's not being forthcoming with us. Well, he's a tough read. Uh, he didn't lie about anything he told us. Next with Tracy, she was instructed to lie three times. When you've worked in um, previous employment situations, have you ever um, permanently borrowed some office supplies from your employer? Um, no. No. What happened here with Tracy was you see her look around a little bit, and then as she's answering no, she's shaking her head yes. No. That's a pretty strong one. Yeah, and, and she did yeah, definitely lie about that. Overall, Joellen no, was able I mean, to identify two okay, well, of Tracy's like three lies. Yeah. Our last subject was and Sherry. To to she was instructed to lie five times. What types of things do you like to do in your spare time? Um, I like hand gliding in Malibu, boogie boarding in Venice. That's a really unusual answer to the question. I mean, what's usually sufficient is I hang glide, I boogie board, but to actually state where you do that type of thing, it's almost, it's almost it's, yeah, it's like overkill. Joellen so caught Sherry in all enough. five of her no. lies. <laughs> I, I'm getting so I can pick up on some of these things now. There's, a, there's definitely a skill to watching this. Either that or these are really lousy liars. <laughs> <laughs> but there are plenty who remain skeptical. The reason that no one can tell you with 100% certainty whether another person is lying is that human beings are too varied. Too varied in how they speak and how they communicate and the ways they communicate. But based on our informal test, of the 84 questions asked of our test subjects, they lied on 10 of the questions. And Joellen was able to identify nine of their lies with just two false accusations. Joellen does admit that body language evaluation is not an exact science. There are no absolutes to it. But if people do pay more attention in their everyday life, and I'm not just saying, you know, stare at everybody that walks around you, but just to be more aware of your environment, you're going to start being more accurate in when you do have to come to serious considerations about whether or not somebody's being truthful with you. Coming up, new evidence on the Shroud of Turin. Is this really the face of Jesus? And next, strange videotape and one man's bizarre claim. There is an intruder, whether you like it or not. When this document surfaced in 1984, UFO believers thought they had found proof of a government conspiracy to cover up evidence of aliens. The document details Majestic 12, a covert group charged with secretly investigating UFOs. At first, it seemed authentic, but skeptics have found serious flaws. The document was allegedly written in 1947, shortly after an alien spaceship reportedly crashed in the desert near Roswell, New Mexico. The typewriter used, however, was not manufactured until 1963. And then there's this, the signature of President Truman, identical to that on another letter, down to a tiny slip of the pen on the H. Majestic 12 is an obvious forgery. There's a cameraman from New Mexico whose name is legendary in the world of ufology. For years, Jose Escamilla has been making fantastic claims about the mysterious objects he has captured on videotape. And now, the claims have gotten even more extraordinary. 
These mysterious images shot in Roswell, New Mexico, electrified the UFO community in 1994. A professional videographer had captured compelling footage of extraordinary high-speed flying objects that no one could explain. By using a special camera shutter setting, Jose Escamilla was able to capture dozens of images of the fast-moving projectiles, which he named rods. When he made his findings public at a UFO convention, he quickly learned that cameramen all over the world were unknowingly documenting the same unusual phenomenon. Well, I know they're everywhere because every time I get a tape, like from Canada or from South Dakota or North Dakota, there's rod activity there. In some places it's frequent, some places it's random. Once Jose discovered how widespread the rod sightings were, he realized their presence was unlike any previous UFO encounters. He began to consider an even more incredible possibility. Could the rods actually be a previously undiscovered life form? Barely visible with the naked eye, but you can see them. And we've measured them anywhere from four inches in length up to approximately 100 feet in length. A hundred feet in length, and Jose has clocked them at 200 miles per hour. It's not an alien, it's not a mechanical thing, it's something that's a living organism of some kind, and it's a biological entity. It's something logical that could be existing among us, we just never saw it before. Incredible as this may seem, Escamilla is convinced the rods are highly evolved, metabolically advanced organisms that live in our atmosphere, often in our very homes. There is an intruder in our homes. There's a thing called a rod that is in your house, whether you like it or not. His video evidence suggests the rods are faster than the shells shot from this tank and intelligent enough to avoid this base jumper. But some insist that Escamilla's unbelievable discovery has a far more believable explanation. I think he's very sincere with this. Uh, I just think he's very mistaken. When Escamilla first released his rod footage to the public, UFO magazine dispatched director of research Don Ecker to Roswell to investigate. Ecker then wrote an article disputing the filmmaker's claims. When I saw the original footage, I was quite intrigued. Now, where he was shooting the majority of his videotape was in an area that could be described as agricultural. And uh, needless to say, it had numerous uh, different types of, of insect life there. It quickly became apparent to me that the majority of his footage uh, involved flying insects. Are the rods an incredible, lightning-fast, previously undiscovered life form, or just ordinary insects? To find out, we sent our own camera crew out with Jose in an effort to document new rod activity. Did you see it over there? Yeah, you saw it. Got yeah, that sucker was moving. According to Jose, our own camera captured images of a rod. Right here. That's definitely a rod. Well, my brief analysis, it appears to be a bug that's being lit up as it flies through the frame. Visual effects expert Ken Jones, who worked on the movies Titanic and Contact, examined the same footage but did not come to the same conclusion. He believes the rods are in fact the product of an ordinary photographic artifact. If you're ever uh, taking a picture of maybe your kid or something swinging a baseball bat, uh, during the exposure you'll see a streak as it moves through. Uh, that's what we call motion blur. Jones believes this motion blur is caused by the wings of birds or insects. I suppose it's going through and flapping its wings at high frequency in one frame as the thing moves through it will make several different flops open closed all of which will be recorded on one frame escamilla disputes the insect motion blur theory claiming that by videotaping at high shutter speeds he can limit its effects misfilmed insects and birds is the biggest misconception for ufos and rods you have to set it at the highest shutter setting most camcorders today have a one ten thousand shutter setting which is the sport setting when you rewind the tape and you go frame by frame, you get a series of still pictures in focus. No blur or anything. But Ken Jones notes that some of the most compelling rod evidence was not shot at this shutter speed. Many of the best pieces of footage, for example, in the uh, free jumpers in the caves, are definitely not being taken at 10 thousandths of a second. Uh, you can tell that because the background images are blurred, which is exactly what you expect if they were shooting at a normal thing as they follow the jumper falling down. 
Entomologist John Pelequin analyzed the same footage and concurred That's with correct. the visual experts. These, what we see here are probably wing beats. It's most certainly an in insect of some sort. I did a lot of videotaping of insects flying for my dissertation. And over years of footage, I've seen things that look very much like this. And in my opinion, these are insects. But Escamilla insists that they are not insects, but vast creatures with highly sophisticated propulsion systems. He has even created a series of computer graphic simulations illustrating how he believes they fly. If these objects were moving by flapping some sort of membrane or wing, and they're 100 feet long and moving 200 miles an hour, your hat would blow off. You're, you'd probably lose your shirt. If there are 100 foot long mysterious objects uh, flying through the air, going right in front of us, then you've got to ask yourself, where are they? Uh, why hasn't any other scientific talent come forward? Such skepticism does not deter Escamilla. We have entomologists, zoologists, biologists. These are the guys that are looking to see if it is a life form or a creature of some kind. We're very interested. But the only way they can give us a scientific opinion is they need a specimen. Despite his many critics, Jose Escamilla will continue to watch the skies, hoping to come up with evidence that cannot be ignored. Until he does, his skeptics will outnumber his supporters. We do share the world with invisible life forms, but they're things like bacteria and, from this videotape, insects. Those things look like insects to me. Coming up, is cryogenic suspension science fiction or science fact? And next, scientists claim they have extracted the DNA of God from the Shroud of Turin. This is the blood from Jesus of Nazareth. The Shroud of Turin. Believers say it is the very fabric used to wrap the crucified body of Jesus Christ, a cloth that actually reveals the face of the Son of God. Whether that's true has been purely a matter of faith for centuries. Now, it's a matter of science. The validity of the Shroud of Turin has been the subject of debate since it was first displayed in Europe in the 14th century. Now, the science of DNA analysis has fueled the controversy anew. An explosive new book claims to prove the authenticity of the Shroud of Turin. Does the Shroud hold the holy image of Jesus? Or is it a fake? the work of an inspired but very human artist. I would say that the image on the shroud is uh, very much authentic. It's an authentic painting of the medieval days. It, this is certainly not a painting. This is a uh, cloth that covered a real wounded body, and the bloodstains are, are consistent with this. Scientific examination of the shroud has led to opposing views. John Jackson runs the Turin Shroud Center of Colorado. He was director of a church-sanctioned scientific study of the shroud in 1978. Jackson has investigated blood studies, fiber samples, computer images, and his own full-scale transparency of the cloth to authenticate the shroud. The image on the shroud is definitely not a painting. Jackson believes the image was created when the color of the linen itself was changed in an unknown process. Perhaps the strongest argument is a simple visual one. Jackson wraps a styrofoam body to demonstrate how the image could only be created by cloth coming in contact with a human being. He argues that the image must be real because everything lines up. It's just too neat a package. And what's interesting then is that the blood stain at the top of the foot here is, is actually lining right where it's supposed to be. So if I just mark it with my finger, push it back, we can see that this blood stain is right over the instep where you would expect a crucifixion nail to have been. The image on the shroud is certainly an image of Jesus Christ. However, it was not produced by contact with his body or any body. The only materials that I find there are paint pigment and paint medium. Dr. Walter McCrone is a respected forensic scientist and director emeritus of the McCrone Research Institute. He was also a member of the 1978 Shroud Research Team, and his studies have been lauded by the scientific community. Dr. McCrone examined 32 samples lifted from the Shroud. This is an actual fiber from a supposed blood stain on the Shroud, 
magnified 400 times. This in particular is from the lance wound in the side. He identifies these tiny red clumps as clusters of pigment particles. In other words, paint, not blood. Each one of those groups are about 100, different, 100 individual red ochre and vermilion particles. I can't think of any two things that look more different uh, when applied to a fiber especially that, than blood and, and this red ochre paint. To settle the matter once and for all, the church in Turin, Italy, authorized carbon-14 tests to scientifically nail down the age of the shroud. In 1988, a seven-centimeter piece of the precious shroud was cut away. Carefully sealed in stainless steel canisters, the pieces of shroud were sent to three different labs. All three labs agreed. The shroud was from the 14th century, not the time of Christ. This confirmed Macron's conclusion that the shroud was painted in 1355. Their figure was 1325, which is very good agreement with my 1355. They're only off 30 years. Rather than put an end to the debate, the carbon-14 dating has forced Jackson and others to find ways to discredit the tests. I think a, a very serious case can be made without carbon-14 that this cloth looks like it really is the burial cloth of Jesus. Put carbon-14 in there and it's, you get something that doesn't really fit. It's like a square peg in a round hole. And the question is, what's, what's wrong here? Jackson argues that a 16th century fire in Chambray, France, damaged the shroud and skewed the carbon-14 dating. The 1532 fire that the shroud suffered actually subtly changed the radiocarbon date of the sample. I think the shroud was certainly created in, in the 14th century. And the idea that the fire in Chambray in 1532 uh, change the carbon-14 content, I think is, is really ludicrous. Uh, uh, in the first place, the shroud was not overheated. It was well insulated by being folded into a pad 48 layers thick. But now, startling new evidence has heated up the debate. Dr. Garza Valdez, a physician and adjunct professor of microbiology, says he has actually discovered DNA on the shroud. He thinks the very DNA of God. We proved that it was blood, that it was human, that it was male. And if you are a believer, the same that I am a believer, if we have the blood of Jesus of Nazareth, we have the uh, DNA of a God. McCrone believes either the samples or the methodology must be flawed. I don't see any reason for considering uh, Garza Valdez's ideas in that direction. I have been able to prove scientifically and completely to the satisfaction of scientists in general that it is a painting. Even John Jackson rejects Garza's new claims. There was no permission as far as, you know, it was uh, not part of a protocol. Dr. Garza acknowledges testing without permission of the church, but he maintains he followed proper protocols. And I have always said that until proven otherwise, for me this is the uh, blood from Jesus of Nazareth. Critics point out even if he had found DNA, hundreds of people have handled the cloth over the years, depositing their own DNA on the shroud. Shroud enthusiasts worldwide are not swayed by the hard evidence undermining the credibility of the shroud. In fact, John Jackson has a new hypothesis. He now believes the shroud was the tablecloth at the Last Supper. You can see some drips here, uh, drip here, and then some drip, 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 drip. So it's like you have two converging drip patterns upon one location. Jackson thinks these spots are food drippings left by a meal celebrated on the shroud. Uh, which we think is the, the Last Supper. That is so asinine. <laughs> I can't think of a thing to say. Macron dismisses the theory as an example of science taking a back seat to faith. I think one of the problems with the shroud is that many of the investigators were firmly convinced that it was authentic. And they saw 
what they would find there if it had been authentic. And this has changed the attitude of, of many of them. And while the Shroud believers try to defuse every scientific attack on their theories, Dr. McCrone keeps his sense of humor. I have always said with respect to the Shroud that the bad news is that it's not authentic. Good news is that nobody believes it. Can new technology bring this frozen corpse back from the dead? If you try to thaw them out using today's technology, it won't work. Cloning, gene therapy, generating transplant organs with fetal cells. All of it was once pure fiction. Now, it's reality. Science promises we're all going to live longer and live better. Maybe the ultimate dream of living forever is not that far off. Art Quaife loves life. In fact, he sees no reason whatsoever that such a good thing should ever have to end. It's just better to be alive than dead. You just don't have much fun while you're dead. <laughs> Uh, life is good, and there's just, uh, and it's going to be good tomorrow, and I expect it will be good uh, the week after that, and uh, uh, I see no reason to ever willingly terminate it. Art doesn't have any magic potion that will make him live forever, but he does have a plan that may help him live again. It's called cryogenic suspension. When Art dies, the Alcor Life Extension Foundation in Scottsdale, Arizona, will take immediate charge preparing his body for frozen storage. First thing we do is get ice onto art to start the external cooling. Then we would gradually begin to add glycerol, which is a cryoprotective agent. It's like putting antifreeze in your car. Once art has been cryoprotected, then he will be gradually lowered in temperature to liquid nitrogen. Then he will be placed into one of our large cryostats for long-term storage and care. Liquid nitrogen's normal temperature is near minus 197 degrees centigrade, cold enough to keep a human body frozen solid. Biological um, organisms will not change. Molecules don't move, enzymes don't do their little enzyme things, nothing happens. So if we can get our patients to that temperature, there is no further biological deterioration and they can wait for technologies to repair them. If this plan sounds utterly fantastic, critics say that's exactly what it is. All one is getting for the procedure's $120,000 price tag is a very expensive funeral. Freezing is good for destroying something if you want to destroy it. the object, you freeze it. Dr. Wallace Sampson, editor of the Scientific Review of Alternative Medicine, says cryonics is not science. It's a wish, really, or a prayer. It's a desire of someone for eternal life. Mainstream medical opinion insists that these bodies can never be reanimated. The body is more than 75% water, and when water freezes, it expands, destroying tissue right down to its molecular structure. Once thawed, all muscle tone is gone. Mushy. I mean, you come out like mushy. <laughs> I mean, you can't flex a mushy muscle. There's no muscle structure there to flex. It's just a bag of mush. David Brin is a writer and futurist. He agrees that the chances of bringing a frozen body back to life are still remote. Right now, I give the present cryonics efforts mm, good credit. I'd say that the guys who are being frozen this year as opposed to those a few years ago, maybe have a 5% chance of waking up and saying, ooh, gosh, beam me up, Scotty. If I were very rich, I'd think about it, but I wouldn't want to spend more than a day signing papers. Of course, cryogenic suspension is a long shot, but Art Quaife is a mathematician, and he's figured the odds. He is betting that future medical science will accomplish the impossible and reanimate his frozen corpse. 100 years from now, I'm not sure whether I'll, I'll be alive or in suspension. 200 years from now, there's a, a reasonable chance that I will be alive and uh, walking around and perhaps on Earth or perhaps somewhere out, uh, out in the uh, solar system, somewhere else. Art is not alone. There are more than 500 other people currently enrolled with not one, but four chronic providers around the country. Even they admit that today's freezing techniques devastate the human brain and body beyond repair. 
When you freeze people, there is damage, and there is sufficient damage that if you try to thaw them out using today's technology, it won't work. Cryonic supporter Ralph Merkel, a research scientist, says being frozen requires faith, faith in the science of tomorrow. He believes that one day nanotechnology, as pictured in these computer graphics, will be able to create microscopic machines that will have the ability to repair every cell damaged by the freezing process. In the future, with molecular nanotechnology, we'll be able to build surgical tools that are molecular, both in their size and their precision, and for the first time, we'll be able to directly intervene at the level where the damage occurs and correct that damage. To critics, molecule-sized robots sound even more far-fetched than suspended animation. They try to bring in scientific explanations for what they're going to do in the future, and I guess there's nothing really wrong with that. It's just that we have many reasons to believe that it can't come to pass. You can't recreate the structure. It would be, have been destroyed. Most important, we may lose our individuality. Even nanomachines may not be able to restore the brain centers for memory and personality. Some of it may be at a microchemical level that can't be duplicated. And some of it may be in the form of a standing wave, a standing electrical wave that simply goes away. In which case, um, the new being that's created won't be you. Although cryonic supporters admit that it might take hundreds of years to create cell repair machines capable of restoring us in body and mind, bodies in suspension have nothing but time. If cryonics works, the only ones alive today who will ever know are the people who have chosen to be frozen. Every year now, there are more than two million Americans who die or are not frozen, and perhaps there are uh, an average of about maybe two that are frozen. So that's around one in a million. I think they're going to look back and say, look at all those people that needlessly went to their graves when they didn't have to. Why were they so dumb? I think, in general, it's a pretty selfish way of looking at life. And I think the more altruistic way of looking at it is to look life realistically uh, in the eye and say, look, we're here for a definite period of time. It only amounts to oh, 10 decades or less. And uh, let's move out and make way for our grandchildren, see how they do with it. Exploring the unknown. The full moon, so be prepared for the unusual. Does a full moon really affect human behavior, or is it all a myth? Nobody's ever found any correlation with the moon phase in any kind of mental function. It's the hottest new medical craze. What magnet therapy will do is accelerate you. But what's really going on? Taking a shower or jumping in a jacuzzi would probably be a lot more effective than putting the magnet on. That's next time on Exploring the Unknown. Not every problem has a solution. Not every fantastic claim can be proven or debunked. But in every story, there are truths to be explored and lessons to be learned. I'm Mitch Pileggi. Until next time, good night.